as an American, like, you know, American, a lifelong Toronto Blue Jays fan yeah. as an American, um, I look at Canada like you guys are our brothers. Like yeah. maybe we disagree on things here and there, but we share a lot of the of the fundamental sensibilities. Lately, though, I don't feel like I can say that anymore. Yeah, I mean, really, I can't think of two countries that are more similar. Uh, we have the world's longest undefended border. We were shoulder to shoulder with you in World War One, World War Two, Korea. Uh, I think that so many people cross the Canada-U.S. border and don't even think that they're doing something yeah. international. Yeah. Uh, culturally, we watch the same TV shows. We listen to the same music. We have a few small differences. We say aboot the hoose. Yeah, right. and, and, yeah but, of course. But, I mean, you've got accents across America, too. Mm -hmm. I think there really are no closer nations than Canada and the United States. But imagine if Gavin Newsom became president of the United States. Oh. And imagine if there were no term limits and he just stuck around. What would happen to America over time? That's what's happened to Canada with Justin Trudeau, who has been re-elected several times and may well be re-elected this year. And so over time, every institution becomes a little bit more radicalized, a little bit more wokeified, and certain checks and balances that you have in the United States, we don't have in Canada. And we saw that laid bare during the pandemic. At least in America, you had some courts stand up for freedom. Mm -hmm. You had some governors, you had, you know, some of the Republicans, you had a spectrum of responses. Sure. There was some pushback. It was not a total uniformity of viewpoint. In, in Canada, none of that happened. You know, there's the, the federal parliament. Every party in there agreed. We have 10 provinces and three territories. Every premier and every opposition party agreed. Every media agreed, every law society every agreed, every law professor, every, every yeah. cultural institution, no one was on the other side. And the odd doctor who dared speak out, he had his license suspended by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And so that's what, that doesn't happen over time. The, the lockdowns and the pandemic laid that bare, but that took years to get ready for. Let me give you an example of how extreme it was. Sure, yeah. Quebec, which is the second largest province, the French speaking province, wonderful place. They put their province under a curfew from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. In fact, you couldn't even go out to walk your dog. How's that a health measure? <laughs> and this curfew was not just for the unvaccinated. It was for vaxxed or not, healthy or sick. That's, that's what you do to, in a prison. You have a locked, that's where the word lockdown came from, prisons. We had a no-fly list domestically. So if you were unjabbed, as I and millions of other Canadians, for whatever reason, we religious sure. or medical or we didn't think we were at risk, if you chose not to get vaxxed, in the second largest country in the world, you were not allowed to board a plane or a train. You had to drive across the longest country, second longest country in the world. And the prime minister himself saw that he could use fear to whip up anger against the unvaxxed because he knew that if someone was unvaxxed, most likely they weren't going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. So he didn't so care, he didn't about, care the, about the yes, yeah. And he demonized them. He, he had a campaign in the middle of, an election campaign in the middle of the lockdowns. And he said, should we even tolerate them? Should we even tolerate them? They're misogynist and extremist. What? what? What did that have to do with anything? Right, right. He just played the message track of the left. And I'm embarrassed to say that he was reelected. And so he's learned the lesson that, that he can get away with it. Mm. And that although some people wake up to it, some people, I mean, I just, I just came from Toronto. People are still, not everybody, there are, there are masks. Sure. People are wearing masks. Some people found meaning in the pandemic. Some people loved strict yeah. rules. They, they, they felt secure in the strict rules. Just like some prisoners who serve a lot of time in prison don't actually know how to survive in freedom. They, they actually thrived in jail. Right. There are some people who love the pandemic. Can you put... Uh, uh put Trudeau in perspective uh, in Canadian history yeah. because like I, I think we look at you know Canadian leadership has always been a little more liberal maybe than what we would expect it, yeah. is he exceptional for Canada well and I mean exceptionally bad his father was prime minister too mm -hmm. for 16 years again that's what happens when you don't have term limits yeah. and his father by by some measures was, was a Marxist I don't think he would have denied that mm. Uh, you might recall that Pierre Trudeau had a true friendship with uh, Castro. He would mm -hmm. go to Cuba all the time. 
Um, in fact, there's, there's rumors, uh, I don't think they've been proven or disproven, that Justin Trudeau, yeah. because of course, uh, Pierre Trudeau's wife, Margaret, was thir about 30 years younger than him. Mm. So she was a young, beautiful woman. And you can see all the photos uh, in, in the late 60s and 70s. Yeah. They were very handsy yeah. with each other. And yeah. I mean, if you compare <laughs> pictures of, of young Castro and young Justin Trudeau, it's eerily similar. There's now, something there for at least a fun conspiracy well, theory, at I the mean, very least. But I, I, have, I haven't seen it proven or disproven. Right, I haven't either. But haven't. here's what we do know. Mm -hmm. Justin Trudeau looks to Fidel Castro as a father figure, mm -hmm. if not actually a father. Which is more important, frankly. Yeah. yeah. And but in an unscripted, he, he had a little town hall, Justin Trudeau, when he was running for office. In an unscripted question, he was asked, what country other than Canada do you most admire? Well, that's a good question. I, I, would, I would think of some interesting answers myself. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. With, without missing a beat, he said, China, okay, no, that's an okay answer. You could, I, I like Chinese food, Chinese people, Chinese language, Chinese history, Chinese culture. There's a lot of things to like about China, mm -hmm. but there's one thing not to like about China, and that's its communist dictatorship. But in his next breath, he said, because of its basic dictatorship, mm -hmm. and then he went on to expand, they can move uh, without uh, the hassle of hearings and concerts. So he said China, and that's not necessarily a bad answer if he were to say, I love the Chinese people and the history and I hope they become free and they can really participate. And like they, they could, sure. He could have said something good, <laughs> but <did>. the one <laughs> thing he mentioned was the odious thing about yeah. that country. And, and he continued down that line. His father, Pierre Trudeau, took the boys to Siberia, to the Soviet Union during the Cold War and said, this is the future, lads. Justin Trudeau has a brother, Alexandra, who has made a documentary film about Iran, okay, published by whom? By the Iranian government. Wow. He wrote a book about China, okay, a lot of people do, I have, mm -hmm. published by whom? Published by the Chinese government. Mm, I'd assume your book was not published. No, by it the was, Chinese no, government. <laughs> yeah. no, it was not. <laughs> and like there's thousands of publishers, you can self publish. Why would you have the Chinese government edit your book and pay for your book? Mm. And Alexandre Trudeau was Justin Trudeau's policy advisor when he ran for the leadership of the Liberal Party. It, there's a big scandal in Canada over the past couple of weeks because the, the Trudeaus have something called the Trudeau Foundation. Mm -hmm. And Alexandre uh, is on the board. Pierre Trudeau's illegitimate child uh, has an has a illegitimate daughter. She's on the board. It's like a family slush fund. Sure. The Chinese government donated hundreds of thousands of dollars, the Chinese government donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Family Foundation. It's, it really is reminiscent of the Clinton Foundation. And there, there was a bit of a scandal because it, the Chinese weren't just donating to the Trudeaus, they were manipulating party primaries. Who would become the candidate for the Liberal Party to run for parliament? There were, there's a lot of Chinese Canadians, but m many of them love freedom. They can't, came to Canada to get away from communism. There's a big Hong Kong tradition in Canada. So there were Chinese Canadians in Parliament who were for freedom. Those districts were targeted by the People's Republic of China, and they ran Chinese Canadians who were pro-Beijing, and they instructed Chinese exchange students and others to get involved and to campaign for the pro-Beijing candidates. And so the freedom-oriented, democracy-oriented Chinese Canadians who were MPs, even who were in the Liberal Party, were expunged by China in Canada. Met, and Trudeau was given a briefing about this by our version of the CIA called CSIS. Mm. They actually felt they had to intervene because a Liberal Party candidate named Han Dong, that's his name, was a Chinese asset, and the, and the our CIA, the CSIS, went to Trudeau and said, you've got, you've got to disallow this candidate. Trudeau waved them off. Of course he wants them. It's the country he most admires. It's the country sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to his family slush fund. And mm -hmm. to this day, Trudeau says, I will not allow an investigation into it. That is Canada. So mm -hmm. there's, let me throw one more thing yeah, at yeah, you yeah. about Trudeau. Mm -hmm. Trudeau's not quite like Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden has no control of his impulses, right. drugs, prostitutes, et cetera. But you can imagine that China had the contents of that laptop 
long before the New York Post did. Oh, yeah. And they didn't even need the laptop because they had direct, like you can imagine all the honeypots. Like Hunter Biden (laughs) is a walking um, uh, extortion (laughs) jackpot. Yes, he really is. He really is. The perfect target. And, And don't think that doesn't affect Joe Biden who may be implicated too. I don't have evidence of that, but Hunter Biden is a disaster. Mm. Justin Trudeau is not as dissolute as Hunter Biden, but Justin Trudeau has a history. And whether it's something as goofy as dressing up in blackface, mm. which he did up until middle age, or sexual harassment. He, he uh, sexually assaulted a woman named Rose Knight in Creston, BC. He later sloughed it off saying, oh, she experienced it differently. But I can only imagine what China knows about him because our own media didn't vet the guy. See, one of the reasons you vet candidates is you want to know their strengths and weaknesses and their policies. But is there a, a ticking time sure. bomb in a guy? Something you don't see coming. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, the Democrat who ran against DeSantis, mm-hmm. Gillum. We, did, we learned things after the election <laughs> right. about dodging a bullet there. Yeah. I think Justin Trudeau is vulnerable from an international security point of view, Mm. and that may explain some of his foreign policy decisions. But in any event, his domestic policy is what really concerns me. He has followed Fidel Castro, the Soviets, the Chinese, the people who he publicly says he admires. If he says he admires them, we should believe him Mm -hmm. when he says he admires them. When Pierre Trudeau died, the only world leaders who attended the funeral, if I recall, one was Jimmy Carter, and the other was Fidel Castro. Those were the only world leaders that came when Pierre Trudeau died. Mm, there was a so closeness funny. there. Mm-hmm. And Justin Trudeau looks up to that tough, tyrant, authoritarian. And over time, Pierre Trudeau, 16 years as prime minister. Justin Trudeau now eight years as prime minister. That's a quarter of a century of Trudeau's running Canada. That can corrode even a free people over mm. time. I was thinking about... The, the sort of affinity that uh, Justin Trudeau seems to feel with a lot of these foreign dictators has relationships with them. It seemed to me COVID gave him the excuse to kind of do a little fantasy league, like a dictator fantasy league oh, yeah. up in Canada. Yeah. We saw it with the Canadian truckers at first. We're seeing it with the churches and religion. Anyone who speaks out against COVID stuff. Can you kind of bring us back? Let's start with the trucking situation. Yeah. I, 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 that was a an inexplicable response from a government over yeah. people who just felt they they should have their rights honored. Yeah. You know, there there was no institutional pushback to Trudeau's authoritarianism during the lockdown. There just wasn't. Mm. Um, the amazing. opposition parties, the media. In Canada, almost every single media company relies on government funding. Uh, obviously, the largest media in the country called the CBC is our state broadcaster. It's owned by Trudeau. Mm-hmm. It's larger than all the private media combined. But every private media takes a bailout from Trudeau. So they magnified his voice. So who opposed? An authentic, organic group of truckers. Truckers are very independent-minded. Most of them are, you know, are alone by themselves. They own their own rig, maybe their contract. Some work for a company, but a lot of truckers, very independent-minded. So it's amazing, these truckers, and it's such a visual thing. A hundred trucks driving on a highway. People literally come out, they want to watch it. People lined overpasses, and it was a revelation that they had been lied to. They had a false consciousness that everyone supported the lockdowns, everyone supported vaccine mandates, Mm. and, and thousands of trucks, and I would estimate close to a million people along the way, maybe, maybe a hundred thousand, but probably multiples of that, visually, physically, personally saw this manifestation. No, we don't all agree. And so it woke up the country that had been hypnotized. No, no, you're the crazy one for not liking this. Because look at this 30 miles of truck coming. Mm -hmm. When they got to Ottawa, what crime did they commit? Did they storm the parliament? No, they did not. Did they have any weapons on them? No, we're Canadian. We're not that armed. (laughs) Were, were there any violent crimes whatsoever? No, in fact, crime in downtown Ottawa fell during the truckers. So what law did they break? Well, they broke some parking fine. They broke some sure. parking laws. And they were honking their horns, and that kept uh, some of the neighbors awake, so they went to court to get an injunction to, to have the honking stopped, and they obeyed. Mm-hmm. They committed no crime. And yet Trudeau was so embarrassed by them that he deployed riot cops. He invoked martial law, and again, the reaction, even by civil liberties groups, was to egg him on more, go harder, crush them. 
all the so-called liberal voices, the civil liberties voices, were either silent or wanted harsher responses. Seizing bank accounts of political opponents, that's Venezuela stuff. That's Castro mm. stuff. Yeah. And, and yet he feels vindicated. Uh, he doesn't feel embarrassed by it. The media party, as I call it, totally supports him. I'm worried about Canada because these things didn't happen overnight. I blame the Trudeaus in part. Of course I do. But that's a lot of institutions failing all at once. Is there uh, hope for a society that doesn't react at all to something like this? I mean, well, like... I, I, you've got, there's got to be hope. And you've got to keep hope alive. And you've got to keep working as if there's hope. And... But the thing is, this problem happened over 20 or 30 years, yeah. so it's going to take 20 or 30 years to get back on course. Trouble is, a lot of the woke craziness from campuses, well, it's now in lawyers and now judges. So, mm. you know, the long march th through the institutions continues in Canada. I am worried about things. Canada is just about five years further down that road than America, so I tell my American friends, hold on to your freedoms. We are a cautionary tale. Look at us as a bad example and hold on to what you have, because I wish that I could go back in time and say to Canadians five, 10 years ago, watch out, beware of what's coming. I can't do that because I don't have a time machine, but I can come here from the future, from America's mm. future, and say, I come from your future to warn you, if you do not be careful, you will be Canadianized. And that's not a compliment. Mm. I, you know, I think one of the most fascinating parts about watching everything, particularly in the COVID era, of watching the strange things that occurred Maybe the most su su surprising part of it was the the, the attacks on faith. Yeah. We saw that here, where you know we have a, a, a clear clear First Amendment that protects religious liberty, yeah. and a, a long standing tradition of it. And still, states try to cl you know shut down successfully in some cases, yeah. shut down s services. Even not even in, in the first weeks, where I still think it was completely uh, completely un unconstitutional to do so, but also months and months, and in, in some cases into a year after the pandemic started. And honestly, like I look at what happened here and it was shocking to me. I, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm surprised we have not seen more action even in the courts to stop this stuff. In Canada, it was considerably worse. I mean, it, what, what's going on now with multiple doctors yeah. in Canada? Can you walk us through? Because I know you've been working with these, sure. uh, ex, uh, with these uh, uh, pastors, excuse me, um, on their legal defense. This is really important work. Yeah. A lot of pastors were jailed in Canada for not closing their churches. More pastors were jailed in Canada for not closing their churches than the pandemic than were jailed in China for the same reason. That is a fact. In fact, there were some Christian pastors who were jailed, one of them, Arthur Pavlovsky's, for 50 days. And today, I just got an update from the court back in Calgary, Canada, that there's a Christian pastor, so we're out of the lockdowns now. Yeah. This pastor was charged because he was feeding the homeless during the lockdowns. They charged him with an illegal gathering <laughs> for feeding the homeless on the street. Incredible. Now they've charged him again because five days ago he went to a drag queen story hour at a public library and sort of heckled them. They arrested him, threw him in is jail. Is there a heckling crime in Canada? <laughs> it is not. A, now, okay. you could say causing a disturbance, but sure. you, you don't jail someone for that. In Canada, we give bail to accused terrorists. And this accused pastor, this morning, was told he must remain in, pr in prison for another eight days, a grand total of 13 days for heckling a drag queen story hour, not for any physical violence. In fact, he had violence done to him. And, and there's silence, silence even from the mainstream church leaders, silence from the civil liberties groups, silence from other politicians. I don't know what's going on. There is a rising anti-Christian bigotry. Justin Trudeau whipped up some of that. He said that the churches were to blame for violating the rights of the indigenous people. There was a string of arson and vandalism. About 50 churches were targeted, and Trudeau didn't say a word about it. And Trudeau's right-hand man, Gerald Butt, said, well, it's understandable. Can you imagine? And I, we don't know who that was because the police haven't investigated with any effort. Was that Antifa? Was that, who, who's torching churches in Canada, burning them down, vandalizing them, desecrating them? And why doesn't anyone care? I say again, if those were synagogues or mosques, there would be a lot of attention to it. 
I think that, that the marginalization of Christians in Canada is a scandal. It's not as bad, obviously, as in Syria, Iraq, China. Sure. But I think that the treatment of Christians in Canada should be put on a human rights watch list. And I would ask Americans, because you care about freedom around the world. I know that congressmen and senators and committees study religious freedom around the world. It's one of my favorite things about America. You care about the world. Give a care for Canada. Put us on your list. We're not the worst problem. We're not as bad as North Korea. But we are a problem, and we could use some kind words because Canadians are always saying, an American paid attention to us. Mm. Canada was mentioned in the New York Times. Like, there, there's a little bit of an inferiority complex in our country because we're, we're like the mouse next to the elephant. Sure. So when the elephant notices us, we're excited. <laughs> I would ask my American friends to mention Canada, to think of Canada, because we're in trouble and we could use some help. Um, can you walk people through if they want to, if they can help out your organization and, and, and what you're doing and how they can get involved? Thank you. I mean, I run Rebel News, which is a news company, and you can check us out at rebelnews.com. And you cover a lot of these stories there. We That's do, but important. sometimes we get involved to actually help. So this Christian pastor who's in jail today, his name is Derek Reimer, and we've set up a website called SavePastorDerek.com. Dot com. And that's a crowdfunding site that pays his lawyers. And actually, if you're Canadian, you'll get a charitable tax receipt mm. for it. So if you, if you want to help this Christian pastor, go to SavePastorDerek.com. He was in court this morning. We'll be there for him in court in eight days. And I'm worried this is going to be a big battle. They want to throw some hate crimes charges at him. Hate crimes charges. Because a Christian pastor is against a drag queen story hour. They want to charge him with hate crimes. That's, this is going to be a bigger battle. Uh, it's SavePastorDerek.com. Yeah. Make sure to check it out. It's Ezra Levant from Rebel News. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Make sure to check out the Ezra Levant Show and head over to Rebel News uh, and the YouTube page to subscribe. Ezra, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me.